My name is Sandeep Lidda. I am a lecturer in Black and Asian British History at King's College London, and I'm also the co-investigator on this ESRC funded project entitled Decolonizing the Curriculum, Teaching Race, Migration and Empire. This study forms part of a broader program of research which is being delivered by the Centre on Dynamics of Ethnicity at Manchester, um, and the broader package of work explores how ethnic inequalities are reproduced at an institutional level. So the aim of our research has really been to think more carefully about the role of teacher training in achieving history curriculum reform in schools. So there's been a lot of heated discussion of late about decolonizing the curriculum in schools and also universities, um, especially since summer 2020, but there's been much less focus in the public sphere about the practicalities of doing this work. So thinking about how a decolonized curriculum is actually taught and who it's taught by and thinking about practical barriers around implementation. It's extremely important to include the histories of race, empire and migration when teaching British histories in school because it forms a core part of our identity as British people. I think usually people have this kind of idea that including empire is somehow politicised or it's, it's done in a tokenist way when I think it's really difficult to um, you know, teach about slavery and then to completely detach that from ideas of empire or to completely, you know, teach slavery without looking into race. There's been a focus for the last, you know, seven, eight years uh, to say that what we want is more of an English island story. And, and that, that phrase almost came out even um, uh, under Michael Gove that we wanted the island story of Britain as if somehow you could teach British history without referring to migration, without referring to empire, without referring to all these kinds of um, things about identity and belonging that actually um, are really fundamental if you want to tell a British story. I'm Pearl Adams, I'm year 13. I study theatre and history at the Brit School. I'm Shay McKelvin and I'm learning music and history at the Brit School. My name is Familiola Jai, but everyone calls me Lola. Um, I study theatre and English and I did study history in secondary school but I stopped studying in year nine. So we learned about the importance of uh, black British history, so like the importance of uh, Windrush events like that as well as the impact of more modern events like the Brixton riots. The most I remember is that they talked about how British people were the merchants and they were only there for like the goods and the trade between that. And they mostly looked at like the American viewpoint of like slave trade and what happened between going from the West Indies and between all the locations. So I think I got like the very stereotypical amount of information about that situation. Without teaching the history of empire, which spans from the 1600s all the way to, it, to its collapse in the 1900s, students don't get a sense of who they are. History needs to help children understand the world that they live in. And if you look at the national curriculum and the way it's framed, it's framed around this idea of nation. What is a nation? How is the nation uh, created? Um, and that really is only a very tiny aspect of the history that we could tell. My mum's from South Africa and my dad's from Zimbabwe, which is obviously um, Southern Africa, which is, has former connections with the British Empire. Um, they like to talk to me a lot about their history and their parents' history and my great-grandparents' history, because my great-grandparents were with the British Army. From year four onwards, I was homeschooled, so a lot of my learning was fueled by my own self-interest. Um, so I was interested, particularly in black British history, after things like the Windrush scandal, 2018, was on the news. I was just very curious to learn about it. And then when I came here, I um, learned about migration and empire with things like the Mayflower voyage and uh, obviously the transatlantic slave trade. Everything that I've learned now is kind of just been out of me going out of my way or noticing things and then looking into it. It is important for British history to represent every student that we teach, for example, Asian, Afro-Caribbean, children, Turkish, Cypriot, etc. And actually every child has their own individual heritage that we need to respect and understand. And especially in light of Black Lives Matter and the recent work in decolonisation, we need to make sure that students are represented adequately and fairly. 
and that their stories and their family stories are represented and valued within the classroom just as much as their white counterparts. Um, it was important for me to sort of see where I'm from as, you know, a biracial woman living in England, as well as being able to see myself in historical individuals like Mary Prince and these important figures that we learn about that we wouldn't have otherwise. We know more about Martin Luther King and we know more about Rosa Parks than we know about Claudia Jones and a bus boycott or Jaya Bendesai and we're missing whole narratives from our stories. London and England now is just like a diaspora of people from like loads of different backgrounds and history now slowly is starting to look at you know the different people that are living here and I just think that as much as we look at British history, we don't really get acknowledged as part of the history and I'm still, I don't know, looking at slavery and the trauma of it. I'm not saying that we shouldn't, but it's, there's like a wider scope of what's going on and I don't really necessarily see like the achievements of people of colour, but it's mostly, again, the trauma and the sad parts. So it's hard to talk about in general, especially with people from different backgrounds that don't necessarily understand my viewpoint on it. Given the events of uh, summer 2020, the renewed uh, momentum in the wake of Black Lives Matter around teaching better, fuller histories of Britain in our classrooms, um, including British histories of race, migration and empire, um, and given that we now have new GCSE courses that allow teachers to kind of engage in a structured way their students in histories of um, migration and empire as they relate to Britain. So we wanted to find out from this point really looking forward what else needs to be done? What are the remaining challenges and opportunities that still exist in terms of effectively teaching British histories of race, migration and empire in the classroom? One thing that we do to, to give more clarity and context of um, Africa before European involvement is to actually consider uh, how uh, Africa developed before European involvement and then that gives the students more context when we actually come on to the scramble for Africa in 1884-1885. Uh, so we actually draw on the work of people like Walter Rodney and his book How Europe Underdeveloped Africa to help give the students more context and, and also to I think have a bit more pride um, in, in what Africa was like before European involvement if you are African. I think that's very, very important. You can't be afraid to allow the students to take an active role in developing their own curriculum. Uh, I can remember my first year of teaching a student coming to me with um, a bit of a felt difficulty about uh, the, the emittance of racism in one of the core textbooks that we, that we were actually using. At Arc Burlington Danes, I have begun to incorporate the histories of race, migration and empire into our schemes of work, particularly for Key Stage 3. Each Key Stage 3 year group studies a migration topic in Year 7, they look at the migration of the Normans, the Angles, the Jutes and the Saxons. In Year 8, they look at the migration of people from the Empire, particularly from West and East Africa. And then in Year 9, we look at the broader migration patterns across the globe, particularly the Empire Windrush coming in 1948. I produced my own sort of lesson plans on resistance and the Empire. Um, so I produced some lessons on the Indian Rebellion, looking at British Empire in India, integrated a little bit on partition as well. I think the rewards of teaching this is it's it feels like a really new topic for children, which in a way is great, but at the same time, it also shows that importance of you know teaching something about you know the British rule in India and for it to feel new to British children. It just shows the importance of why we need to continue to teach it and to make it feel like it's a very real part of history and a very recent part of history as well to think of when partition happened just in the late 40s, not a very long time ago at all. The first time I started doing this, it was met with rather mixed reception. Some students saw it as tokenistic and I think that's a real problem. You just add a bit to make it something it's not. But actually some students rejected the idea that actually history could be so multifaceted and actually a lot of students made quite nasty comments not deliberately but out of misconception but actually the challenges have been met with an equal degree of success and actually students feel valued I've got children who 
look genuinely shocked with the racism that they hear about or genuinely shocked about the British treatment of people in India or Africa or in, uh, when it comes to slavery. We do need great resources and we do need scholarship driven resources. Um, but we also we also desperately do need um, to think harder about what's happening in teacher training spaces and particularly to support um, practitioners in teacher training spaces to help them to help them also think through um, how they can engage their trainees with British histories of race, migration, and empire, and how they can also integrate kind of um, you know thinking about racism and anti-racism within um, the teacher training kind of structure. The first steps for me, I'm going to say, towards decolonizing the kind of curriculum that I do in ITE, that therefore enables teachers to start unpicking and decolonizing and diversifying the curriculum they teach in school. I, I think that's a really important step. Um, but it has to happen because otherwise we're not doing justice to history and we're not doing justice to the kinds of history we, we teach to the children we have in front of us. I think that's such an important thing. I can remember when I did my teacher training and I read an article that the year before only three black teachers had been offered PGC places um, up and down the country. Um, so I think representation is an area that definitely needs to improve in order for um, more, uh, more black and more diverse history uh, to be represented in the curriculum. Um, so it's not only about the curriculum choices that we make, but it's also about the people that are delivering that content and making sure that young black students also see themselves in the people that are delivering that content and actually guiding and teaching them in the classroom. I trained as a teacher 10 years ago and we had no purposeful discussion about race and empire and migration. We talked about slavery, but I trained in Bristol, so I was quite lucky to have that experience all around me. Whereas actually we don't do enough at the moment because actually these discussions should be purposeful and should be led on a deliberate basis rather than a reactive, it happened to me, something was said in the classroom discussion. I was really fortunate to do my teacher training at the Institute of Education who really encouraged trainee teachers to develop more, uh, more inclusive and diverse uh, historical topic areas. So at Leeds Trinity University where I did my training, um, we had whole units looking at diversity and also looking at decolonization as two separate topics. There's a, a huge way to go still with not only schools providing it in the curriculum, so from a government level, but also teachers feeling equipped and safe and comfortable to train, things like that, especially when they get that sort of backlash from parents, for example. So I think a lot more needs to be done to make teachers feel um, comfortable with teaching and also to feel they have the knowledge to teach these sort of topics as well. I personally believe that there is a long way to go for teacher training in order to facilitate the teaching of race, empire and migration in the history classroom. I believe that there is a huge gap that needs to be addressed um, and that people across history departments across the UK need to work collaboratively in order to address that gap. I think that there is definitely scope for local universities to reach out to schools in order for that gap to be um, closed. But also I think that there needs to be more teacher training which is free and available to all in order to teach us how to teach about empire, race and migration. The curriculum, much like the world around us, is changing all the time and it's really important that schools change with the times. Uh, therefore, schools need to ensure that they're bringing in expert um, external advice to, to help their teachers to understand uh, the, the current debates around, um, around racism and anti-racist pedagogy, that they also empower their existing teachers to become the experts as well. So offering teachers opportunities to conduct research into arguments such as should we decolonise the curriculum, uh, carrying out um, research projects into uh, more cross-curricular opportunities and how that can actually help with, uh, with, with diverse teaching approaches. I think what could be done is these sort of ideas are integrated more into history and they shouldn't be seen as just separate units. I think it's really easy to do a separate unit on empire when, as I said before, how can you really teach about empire and, and kind of dismiss it when you're teaching about the wars, for example, how can you discuss colonized troops, talk about troops from Asia, talk about troops in Africa and not really, you know, recognize empire or kind of accept its existence. 
for teachers who are committed to teaching more uh, about empire, migration and racism, there's already a wealth of knowledge out there uh, that they can draw on. Uh, Running Mead are doing a terrific job at uh, conducting research into, into areas such as race, empire and migration. Uh, Organisations like Justice to History are doing a terrific job as well and um, a, a whole host of academics um, that are already doing phenomenal work. The more you grow up and the more experiences that you get and understand the history of like why things are set up the way that they are, it helps you to create better choices, which of course is what history is supposed to be about, learning from past mistakes and discoveries and then having the confidence to do the right thing after. I think the important thing is, is if we expand the curriculum, it doesn't take away from individuals like Shakespeare or Churchill or medieval period. It, they hold an important part um, of our history and an important seat at the table, but the table needs to be bigger. I think the British Empire has a very profound legacy and the effects of which we still kind of live in today. So I think if we don't engage with these topics, then people, you know, you're neglecting a big chunk of British history that's very important and relevant to the world today. To not teach those topics would be an admittance of a really important part of our country's narrative. Migration, because migration is responsible for so much of the rich culture that we have in Britain today. Empire, because it's connected to so many parts of the world and will have impacted on the stories of so many of the young people that we teach. And finally, racism, because it's still prominent in our society today. And young people have, I think, the right to understand how and why it developed, uh, what different forms it can take, and what they can do to hopefully challenge it today.